All right. Welcome, everyone, to ASX's first Star Talk of the Year. We'd like to thank Professor Kreitz for joining us today. She is an assistant professor at U of T's David A. Dunlop Department of Astronomy and Astrophysics, as well as the Dunlop Institute for Astronomy and Astrophysics. In her research, Professor Kreitz develops and uses millimeter wavelength instruments to investigate the first billion years following the Big Bang. If you have questions during this talk, please feel free to type that you do in the chat and we can unmute you so you can ask your question. Please save really hefty questions until the end during the Q&A period. So without further ado, take it away, Professor Kreitz. Hi, thank you so much. It's funny, I have a cat tail as part of my welcome. Um, yeah, I really appreciate you all inviting me to give this talk. I'm literally looking forward to it. And I'm gonna share my slides so that you all can see those. And if you give me a heads up that it's working, then I'll go ahead and get started. Great, can you see my slides? Oh, yes, we can, sorry. Great. <laughs> Um, all right, so I'm going to be talking to you today about uh, building instruments to measure our cosmos. And I'll tell you a little bit about me first. Um, so, you know, I've already been introduced, as you know, I'm a professor here um, in astronomy and astrophysics. Um, I got my PhD in astronomy and astrophysics from the University of Chicago, and before that, uh, my bachelor's in physics at Caltech. And I'm also actually a visiting associate in the physics department at Caltech as well, where we do part of our research um, that I'll talk about here today. And this picture is kind of just starting to give you an introduction to what I'm talking about, which is how do we actually build these cameras? Um, so that's me and my one of my favorite activities. Um, I'm soldering the back of one of these focal planes that we use um, for millimeter wavelength astronomy. And this is just a few more um, pictures to get you excited about what we do. Um, the left picture is the 12 meter telescope um, on Kitt Peak. So it's a radio telescope um, run by the Arizona Radio Observatory with me and my colleague with our camera. Um, I've also been to the South Pole where we do a lot of our research on millimeter wavelength astrophysics. And in the bottom there is kind of me taking an uh, angle grinder to a piece of equipment to kind of really um, make things work in a hands-on way. So before I talk to you about my specific research, um, I, I will talk a little bit about, you know, how we make observations of the universe. And, you know, this is kind of the typical way we think about it. Um, you know, there's a bunch of stars and galaxies out there. Um, we have a telescope or even our eyes and we can take a look at those objects and learn information about our universe. Um, but, you know, we don't just have the visual portion of the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, so the electromagnetic spectrum is just the light that we um, can capture either with our eyes or the instruments. Um, and this electromagnetic spectrum has light at a huge range of frequencies. And we're really familiar with the frequencies in the visible spectrum um, because those are the frequencies that our eyes can see. Um, but there's a ton of information there about our universe from you know, gamma rays to x-rays to ultraviolet, you know, in the visible, of course, um, in the infrared microwave where I work, and in the radio as well. So um, I think some folks from my class are here, which is awesome. Um, we've been talking a lot about this for uh, one of our labs. And I really like this. Um, I hope this video works. Um, but this is actually a video made by some folks at Cardiff University. Um, if you want to see it yourself, it's called the chromoscope. Um, and it actually does a visualization of what our universe looks like, specifically looking at our galaxy, but you can see some extra galactic stuff as well, um, as you actually scale, uh, like as you actually look at the universe in different wavelengths of light. So, you know, you can go from the visible to the near infrared. This is the near infrared sky. Um, and this is a cool thing. If you're interested, you can go look at it because it tells you where that data comes from um, and you can study it further. Um, it shows you the microwave, so that's what the galaxy and the extragalactic um, background looks like in the microwave. Um, and then it goes all the way to the radio, and then we'll show you kind of the universe. And what you can take away from this is a couple of things. You know, one of the things is that different wavelengths give you information, sometimes about very different structures. Um, but, you know, if we just look at our galaxy or our universe, um, in the visible, we're actually missing quite a bit of information. And so a lot of the work that I work on is looking at different wavelengths of light to kind of get some other 
uh, windows into what we have to see. And that's the gamma ray sky. Um, and then you can see it going back to the visible. Great. Um, so there's that, all that information out there um, over the range of the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, and I'm going to kind of tell you how we uh, capture that information um, through our careers as astronomy, uh, what we sometimes call builders, um, so people that build instruments. And we have to think about a couple of things uh, before we build the instruments. And that one of those things is, you know, what do we specifically want to look at? Um, and what do we, and then the second thing is, you know, what technology that we need to do this and what technology do we not have and need to develop? So I'm going to talk to you briefly, like three little stories um, about how we decide what to look at, because there are very many different ways to figure out what you want to look at on the sky. Um, the first example is the cosmic microwave background. And I like this example because it's kind of a little bit of theory and a little bit of serendipity. So, you know, one of the ways we decide what to look at in the sky are we have astronomers and physicists who have pr made predictions about what we expect to measure in our universe. And then as, you know, uh, astronomy instrumentation folks, we think about how you can make that measurement. Um, but the cosmic microwave background um, is actually the first light emitted in the universe. And when the universe first began, you know, it was this incredibly, incredibly in this incredibly, incredibly dense state. And it started to expand very rapidly. But before the cosmic microwave background was emitted, um, photons existed, but they immediately would scatter off of electrons. And basically, the universe was this dense, dense plasma. But at some point, the universe actually expanded enough that those photons were able to free stream through the universe. And those have actually been in the universe um, traveling uh, till this day. And those photons have lost energy as the universe has expanded. So we measure them in the microwave today. Um, but they give us kind of a picture of our universe and a lot of fundamental physics about our universe as it was at the very beginning. And this is kind of a fun story because um, many of you might have heard it. Um, but there were folks that we're having kind of an argument about whether the universe was static or whether the universe was expanding. And the measurement of the cosmic microwave background is really the first thing that said, like, no, it's definitely expanding. Um, and there were folks that were trying to measure it at that time um, to you know, prove that they were correct about it expanding. Um, but there were also some other folks that were doing radio astronomy um, at, and working on a telecommunications uh, company. And they actually uh, are called Penzias and Wilson, and they just actually got a Nobel Prize for being the first to discover the cosmic microwave background because they had their radio receiver and they kept seeing this excess source of noise and they did everything that they could possibly do to try to mitigate these, the source of noise and it was still there and they ended up publishing a paper that was the first measurement of the cosmic microwave background that was called like, I think like excess noise at like a given frequency. So that's kind of an example of astronomers kind of knowing what they want to look for, but like also kind of making a serendipitous discovery. Um, another way to decide what to look at is to kind of think about analogs in our solar system. And exoplanet observations is a good example of this. So a lot of folks are looking for so-called habitable planets or planets that might be similar to our planet. And one of the ways they do that is to look for, you know, absorption lines that look like uh, they might come from things such as water or things that we have that are analogous. So then you would build an instrument that can look at lines that you expect to see um, in a potentially habitable planet. And then the third thing that I'll talk about is uh, UV transients. And so another way to actually decide what you want to look at on the sky and in what wavelength is to look at signals that might accompany other measurements in physics. So a great example is, you know, gravitational waves emitted from mergers. Um, so, you know, there's black hole, black hole mergers. But when neutron stars merge, you actually get an electromagnetic signal as well as a gravitational wave signal. And so what we're interested in doing actually here at the U of T is building a UV transient satellite that can actually follow up on those mergers uh, that LIGO and Virgo and Cagra and the um, gravitational wave detectors will continue to detect. So um, folks can stop me now if you have questions. That's kind of my background of like, what do we look for? Um, how do we decide to look for it? And I'm going to move on to what we actually need to make the measurements. And it's two basic things. We need a telescope to gather the light, and we need a detector to collect the photons. 
And I'm going to kind of go through quickly um, just a couple of different images of a galaxy in different wavelengths of light and what the telescopes look like. Because what you'll kind of get just from seeing these images is that, A, as I said before, there's much information in different wavelengths. Um, and that the telescopes can be, you know, quite different or in some cases very similar. So this is the uh, Chandra X-ray telescope. Um, this is an ultraviolet telescope and a galaxy in the ultraviolet. Um, this is a galaxy in the visible wavelengths. And, you know, those, this, these are the wavelengths that you can see with, um, you know, a telescope, an optical telescope, you know, a common one from the ground or the Hubble Space Telescope, among others. Um, oops, see that one a little too fast. Um, this is a galaxy in the infrared. And this is a galaxy in the radio. And what you can see is actually this one looks very different from some of the galaxies in other wavelengths. And um, one of the things that's exciting about this is that, you know, you can see that this galaxy is actually quite dim in the places where in the visible light it was quite bright. Um, and we talked about this in class as well. Um, all the brightest parts are actually where there's a lot of molecular gas that could actually form stars. And so on, astronomers can figure out like what regions are available to form stars and what regions have no molecular gas and will not actually be able to form stars um, in the future. So that was like a very brief uh, talk about the actual telescopes. Um, I'm gonna tell you a bit about detectors um, because that's my passion. Um, you know, building new detectors to actually make measurements of cosmology and uh, astrophysics. And I actually work on the cosmic microwave background, and I also work on studying galaxies that were formed around a billion years after the Big Bang, and that are actually ionizing our universe and kind of turning it into the universe that we see today. So the ingredients for a detector are, you know, somewhat clear, probably. Um, so you need something to absorb the photons and something to record the signal. So, you know, the most basic version of that is your eyes absorb the photons and your brain records the signal. And maybe that's like not, I don't know, my brain is not the best at recording signals for long periods of time. Um, but uh, we have other ways to actually make those records. And uh, this is an example. So this is Annie Jump Cannon. Um, she's examining photographic plates. So this was an early way that we were able to, you know, detect photons and then record the signals um, in a very, uh, you know, clear way. But you know, mo in modern times, we use either charge coupled devices or uh, CMOS detectors, uh, specifically in the optical wavelengths, but also in some other wavelengths. Um, so this is just a silicon chip that absorbs photons and creates electrons that can be read out as electrical signals by a computer. And in the millimeter wavelength, we actually use something called a transition edge sensor, which I will go into quite a bit of detail later on. And then the X-ray, we actually use CCDs as well. Um, though you can also use bolometers in the x-ray. <laughs> um, and in the infrared, you can use bolometers. Um, and in the radio, you can also use bolometers or you can use feed horns and amplifiers um, as we do in the lab in my class. <laughs> um, so, you know, we talked about what we decide to look at and I'm kind of going to zoom in on one piece of science as well as one piece of technology and talk about how we develop that and just as astronomers that build instruments, uh, what our lives are like. Um, and you all are welcome to ask me after like what a career in this is like. Um, I'm partially through my journey, so, but um, I will tell you what I can about the life of an astronomer. So a key thing that I like to think about before like going into depth is that we're actually very lucky um, that the speed of light is finite. <laughs> Um, and the fact that the speed of light is finite means that if you're looking out in space at things that are far away, you're actually looking back in time. And this allows us to see the universe not as it is just today, but as it is, as it was like billions and billions of years ago. And you all may have heard this, um, a lot of times like this is a piece of trivia, like the, you know, the sun is eight, like it takes eight minutes for light to get from the sun to earth. Um, and the sun is 93 million miles away. So we're seeing the sun as it was eight minutes ago. Um, and if we kind of take this to the extreme, um, you know, the nearest star is 20 million million miles away. Um, and it takes light four years to travel from that star to us. So we're seeing it as it was four years ago. And, you know, sometimes when we're talking about cosmology, we put things in 
units of distance that kind of obscure how far away things really are, such as like, it's like it's four light years away, you know, it's nearby. Um, but really, if we kind of think about this, um, the nearest galaxy is 8 billion, billion miles away. Um, and it actually takes 2.5 million years for light to travel from Andromeda to us on Earth. So we're actually seeing as it was 2 million years ago. So you're kind of getting an idea of, you know, we really are looking at the history of the universe just by doing astronomy. And the cosmic microwave background, which was that first light ever emitted in the universe, it's 4,000 billion billion miles away. And we're seeing light that's been traveling for 13 billion years. You know, we're, we're seeing the cosmic microwave background as it was more than 13 billion years ago. And they were really allowing ourselves to um, understand the history of the universe. And this is kind of a plot that just puts it all on a scale that kind of maybe minimizes how vast the universe is. Um, but this just shows you the universe on a timeline, starting from the Big Bang, all the way you know, through the cosmic microwave background, through all of those first astronomical objects forming to the present day here where we can measure it with our telescopes. So, one of the things that I'm going to tell you is, you know, how do we actually observe the early universe? But first, we'll talk about what makes it challenging and what makes it worthwhile. And the three things that I think make it really challenging are the objects are very far away, so they're very faint. Um, the signals we're trying to measure are very tiny. And the wavelength of light is different than when we measure with our eyes and everyday cameras. But what makes it worthwhile is we really are probing physics when the universe is less complicated, so that helps us understand the physics better. And we're probing high energy physics that you couldn't necessarily create in the modern universe. So, you know, as I mentioned, like that one is objects are very far away and very faint. Um, so we already have a challenge of making sure that we need to have sensitive enough detectors to actually make these measurements. Um, and the signals that we're trying to measure are actually very tiny. So in the example of the cosmic microwave background, um, you know, that Nobel Prize winning science, um, the black body temperature of the cosmic microwave background was three Kelvin. So three degrees above absolute zero. So everything around us is about 300 Kelvin. It's like emitting um, photons, like a 300 Kelvin black body. And we're trying to measure something that's three Kelvin. But then on the top of that, there's more modern experiments. Um, the ones we're building today are looking at the tiny fluctuations in the cosmic microwave background. And that's where the physics is really encoded. And those little fluctuations are 10, 100,000 times fainter than the actual cosmic microwave background itself. And some of the signals that we're looking for, um, including something called inflationary B modes, so signals from that first period when the universe expanded at this incredibly, incredibly rapid rate, those signals are even smaller, possibly arbitrarily small. So we need to measure very tiny signals. And then the other thing is that, you know, this, there's a lot of stuff that goes into making the cameras. Um, <laughs> that uh, we use to measure visible light, but there isn't quite such a um, like commercial application, I would say, um, for looking at things in the microwave. Um, so we're actually kind of often building prototype sensors or building new types of sensors uh, from scratch rather than you know, buying off the shelf sensors. And that's exactly what I'm gonna describe to you is like what those sensors are like and how we build them and how we, like, how we use them essentially. Um, so one of the main technologies that we use are something called superconducting transition edge sensor bolometers. Um, and what a bolometer is, is a, essentially an absorber that when photons hit it, it actually heats up. And then we measure out that um, change in temperature with a very sensitive thermometer. And what those devices actually look like in real life is um, they look like this metal mesh. And it's actually been etched away um, in a micro devices laboratory, like in the same way that you would make chips for computers, essentially. Um, you actually plate these chips with metal and then etch them out uh, with acid or uh, other things. And that's how those sensors are made. And then tiny, tiny over here off on the side, there is a superconductor, which is a metal that has a very low resistance at low temperature. And we actually use those to read out the signals from our detector. So um, if you're familiar with how resistors work, essentially uh, they follow something called Ohm's law. So the voltage is equal to the current times the resistance um, in that circuit. Um, and resistors normally just have this constant resistance. So you know that's resistance to the flow of current. But for a superconductor, 
when it gets to a certain temperature, it's critical temperature, it actually drops in resistance extremely, extremely quickly. And then when it gets to zero resistance, you have what you call the superconductor. So, you know, it conducts extremely well uh, because it has essentially zero resistance. Um, and we actually use this technology because, as I said, when those photons hit that absorber, they actually heat it up. Um, and when you heat up a device that actually follows this curve, you could see that it changes resistance. And it changes resistance really quickly as a function of tiny, tiny changes in temperature. And that actually allows us to make those really sensitive measurements that we need to make of those really faint signals on the sky. And you might notice something else, which is that the temperature axis is in Kelvin, um, so absolute temperature. Um, and the temperature here is 0.45 Kelvin, so about half a degree above absolute zero. So a large part of our work is actually cooling these sensors down to these incredibly low temperatures where they actually can operate. And these sensors are actually built in arrays, so that's what the arrays of the sensors actually look like. And these sensors specifically um, were developed at Caltech and the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, um, so that NASA laboratory um, in Pasadena, California. And what is actually done, um, and this was actually done by a graduate student in our group, um, is there was a design made for these detectors. And then that design was passed to the folks at JPL where they actually fabricated the detectors. And this is just a picture of us like putting it in various different setups to test it. There we're just testing gravity. <laughs> no, we're just testing that like our clips are actually holding the detectors into the circuit board. So a big part of the building of instruments is those detectors. Um, so we do a lot of research and development to actually make sensors that work for our specific application. And as I said, we don't buy them off the shelf, so we actually design them. Um, each of the different groups that's doing this kind of astronomy has a similar sensor, but like there's tweaks that we develop and um, we actually kind of spend years actually doing the research and development to create those sensors. And then the other thing we do is design and implementation of the cryostats that we actually need, because I mentioned that those detectors have to be cooled to 250 millikelvin. Um, we actually spend a lot of time on cryogenics. So this is actually a mechanical design, so uh, computer-aided design, CAD design, um, that we actually use to design what the camera itself will look like. So that this design that holds the detectors, it's like, in, it's a camera, essentially. It's like the equivalent of this, but in the millimeter wavelength range. Um, so we design those. Um, they're fabricated uh, by mechanical shops like that actually you know machine the aluminum or copper parts and then we put them together and test them in the lab and this is just like sort of a funny picture but this is like demonstrates our real life as <laughs> experimental astrophysicists is that you make this design um you fabricate this design you put the design together and then in the end there's something non-ideal about the design that like in my case requires me to take an angle grinder and like grind part of it off so that it actually fits um <laughs> so that's just kind of a little bit of you know you have the design but the implementation is unexpected at times And we spend a lot of time in labs. So as astronomers, you know, there's observational astronomers, there's theoretical astronomers. As um, experimental astronomers, we spend a lot of time building these instruments in the lab. So this is actually the cryostat beside me. Um, and all these layers that you see are increasingly cold layers with different refrigerators that get this central part of the detector down to uh, 250 millikelvin or a quarter of a degree above absolute zero. Um, and I don't know, that's just me being silly and making myself a hat out of aluminized mylar. Um, but typically, aluminized mylar is used for its reflective properties, um, as well as its electri electrically conductive properties to um, you know, essentially reflect the light in the same way that you need to uh, on spacecraft and other space telescopes, as well as uh, create a RF block for our instruments to shield them from radio frequency interference from the environment. So after we do the design and implementation, we do a lot of time testing um, these instruments. So one of the things that's really important is that the detectors are getting photons from the sky. And to make your instrument as efficient as possible, you would ideally like to accept 100% of those photons. Um, but because of non-idealities of the designs, you actually sometimes only accept like say 50% of the photons. And that would be a case where you'd be like, whoops, we should probably like try to do this again. Um, but ideally, you need to make a measurement to see how many 
or what percentage of the photons you're actually absorbing from the sky in the lab before you put an instrument on the telescope. So um, this is actually a very similar measurement to one of the ones that we're doing. So I'm teaching astronomy 325 326. Um, this is a very similar experiment to the one that we're doing uh, this week in lab, um, but with a different kind of detector. So what we do is we actually take something that is a perfectly a perfect black body so it's emitting black body radiation at room temperature and then we take another one that is liquid nitrogen temperature and we actually look at it with our instrument and you know in the wavelengths that our eyes see they don't look that different but um they're emitting uh this radiation that you can absorb with your detector and you can actually measure the difference in power between um the liquid nitrogen and the echozorb temperature um, and this is actually a picture of me and my mom um, we're also like sometimes not the best at work-life balance um, while we're working on it. So uh, one time I had to work on a holiday, so my mom actually came with me to lab and it was really nice, except she didn't wear closed-toed shoes in the lab. <laughs> and these are just a few more pictures of what it's like to actually take those instruments um, and deploy them on telescopes. Um, so these are pictures of me working on that same cryostat with some graduate students and um i feel like that like i like that one on the right because it kind of reminds me of like circle time like in elementary school um where you're all sitting around like talking about something or having show and tell but we're like all working on the cryostat out there together and this is us with that same instrument but uh we actually have it outside the lab um and this is on kit peak so uh like i said uh where that 12 meter radio telescope is. Um, it's in Arizona um, in the US. And this is actually another image of the telescope. So that's a huge telescope dome. Um, you know, that's a 12 meter telescope. So that dome is huge. Um, and we're lifting all of the pieces of equipment for the telescope um, into that dome. And that's our camera. And it's being lifted. Someone told me a funny story on this day when we were lifting this cryostat after our, I would say five years of work in lab to get this cryostat ready. Um, someone said like, oh, I knew someone that was doing this back in the day and the crane broke and like their entire instrument was dropped from 20 meters. <laughs> and I was like, why are you telling me this? Um, but yeah, like there was like, that was a har harrowing and exciting day um, of taking this camera that you've spent years of your life building um, in collaboration with many other folks um, and installing on a telescope so that you can do astronomical observations. So that's like what it looks like from below when you're like, please don't fall. Um, and yeah, so this discussion kind of brings me to a point about doing um, like experimental astrophysics, which is that we work in big collaborations and sometimes small collaborations. Um, but we typically work together with many other scientists. And one of the things that I like most about this job is that you do many different things. So you do computer programming, like, you know, you do analytical calculations very infrequently, um, unless you're a theorist. Um, you know, you actually hands-on build things. You do that computer-aided design. You do data analysis. Um, and you can really enjoy, like, a spectrum of different activities. And some people end up doing like one specific one and some people do the whole range, but there's many people in these groups um, and kind of playing a part in the team there. And one of the other cool things is like most of those pictures I showed were um, at Kit Peak, but um, for the work that I've done on the cosmic microwave background, we actually had our telescope at the South Pole and this is the South Pole telescope there. Um, Another one of the things that I think is incredibly exciting about our jobs is you get to travel to places um, that you might not get to go to otherwise, um, including the South Pole. And that's just a picture of some of the scientists that were working on the instrument um, at that time that we were installing one of those cameras. And then the other really amazing thing is that, um, you know, we have collaborators at all career stages, like from faculty to undergraduates and high school students all working together to make these uh, experiments actually happen. Um, and folks have done things like I just put some of the cool projects that these students did. Uh, you know, one of the students built this giant magnetic coil to test the magnetic susceptibility of our instrument. Um, one of the students made detector masks to make detectors for our instrument um, and all manner of things. Um, and it's just like, you know, there's just many people plugging into this and making incredible contributions to these instruments. 
and you know now we're not actually collaborating in person quite as much um but we still collaborate even on zoom so this is one of our collaboration meetings um with a team uh, that is building those instruments to study early galaxies um so you know we're managing to keep in communication um even with uh covid but uh you know it's definitely difficult to be an experimental astrophysicist in the time when you don't necessarily get to go to lab all right so um before we wrap up and ask for questions i'm going to talk a little bit about an example um, of like what we can actually measure with these instruments and just kind of one of the things that i think is one of the most kind of historically exciting things that we've discovered with the cosmic microwave background and you know with these detectors and instruments that we develop like there's many different things that you can discover um you know there's astronomy and astrophysics you know uh, properties of galaxies like some of the things that i'm interested in studying i'll just say what they are in general um because it's just kind of cool that you can build these instruments and then you can study this huge broad range of science topics um you know so i'm interested in studying molecular gas um in galax nearby galaxies with these instruments um i'm interested in studying neutrinos so you can see what effect neutrinos have on how our universe grows um, in the cosmic microwave background. So that's kind of a property of, you know, that's some fundamental physics you can do with the cosmic microwave background. Um, like I mentioned, I'm interested in measuring ionized carbon. So that's like a carbon molecule in galaxies um, about a billion years after the Big Bang. Um, and I'm interested in inflation. So, you know, what really happened when that universe expanded at that incredibly rapid rate, like 10 to the minus 34 seconds after the Big Bang. Um, and there's much more like that you can study with all of these instruments and some of it I'll show you here. Um, so this is actually what the cosmic microwave background looks like. So that colorful plot is like what the whole sky looks like in the cosmic, like measuring the cosmic microwave background with the Planck instrument. But if you zoom in on it, you can actually see like this structure formation here. Um, and what we did with the South Pole Telescope um, that I showed you is we actually use the fact that the South Pole Telescope is a 10 meter dish versus Planck, which is much smaller. It's harder to launch a large dish into space, um, as you might guess. Um, but when you have this big dish, you can actually see things with much, much finer resolution. And when you do that, you can actually start to see things in the cosmic microwave background, like the bumpy structure is what encodes all of that physics. Um, but the bright dots are actually, you know, um, brightly emitting galaxies. Um, the darker dots are clusters of galaxies. So these big, big structures of many, many galaxies that um, have really hot X-ray gas in them that you can study in the cosmic microwave background. But you can really discover so much physics and astrophysics by making these measurements. And one of the things that I think is the most incredible thing we've learned like in history from the cosmic microwave background, and we've also learned this from other sources, there's other evidence of these different things, but what we've learned is what the universe is made of. So what the universe is made of is baryons, which is normal matter, so basically what we're made of, stars, planets, um, matter that you can see. Um, the universe is made of dark energy, and it's made of dark matter. Um, and we know this in part because of the cosmic microwave background. And this is a really cool tool that I love. Like this is, shows you a bit visually how astronomers analyze data from the cosmic microwave background. So you can go to this website if you wanna actually use it yourself. Um, but the, depending on the content of the universe, um, there's like a pie chart over here that shows you, uh, this is just a model of what the universe would look like if you had atoms, a bit more than 50% atoms. Um, there's a little bit less than 50% dark matter. And then there's a tiny bit of dark energy in this model. And then what they do in this model is predict what the cosmic microwave background would look like. And then if you actually decompose that map into what we call the power spectrum, it is essentially taking each of those components and uh, decomposing it into its frequency components um, using some, a Fourier transform. Um, you can get a measurement that shows you this curved line, which basically encodes all of these, this physics about what the universe is made of. And if you change what the universe is made of, so here they've made the universe, as I said, half atoms, a little less than half dark matter and a tiny bit of dark energy. Um, that model actually predicts this blue line here, which looks nothing like the data which we've measured. <laughs> um, so we know that that's wrong. So we know the universe isn't mostly atoms. And if you kind of say, well, maybe it's mostly dark matter, then you get a different plot. This is a model and this is the real data. 
And so you can tweak those parameters and we do this in a, um, you know, using a likelihood or like a sum of squares. Uh, you know, we basically mathematically determine what the best fit to this model is, but really this lets you kind of see it visually. So if you change the content of the universe, you can change the spectrum until you get something that matches reality. And this gets kind of close. It's like, ah, it's 75% dark energy, 4% atoms, and 22% dark matter, and you're getting close. Um, but then you can get the real answer from doing the data analysis and discover that the universe is 74% dark energy, 22% dark matter, and 4% baryons or atoms. And I think this is one of the most fascinating things that you can discover with the CMB. And you know, this opens so many more questions um, than it answers. Um, you know, 75% of the universe is about is this unknown dark energy. Um, from other measurements, we know that the universe is expanding at an increasingly rapid rate because of this dark energy. Um, even for the matter in the universe, most of it is stuff that we can't see with our eyes. Um, so, you know, this opens an incredible number of things that we can do in physics and astronomy to actually study our universe and try to actually understand that on a deeper level. So that's really what I have to say. Um, I would love to hear questions um, about the science or about careers in astronomy, um, about day-to-day -day life. I mean, day-to-day -day life does involve more like emailing than like I described in this talk. Um, but yeah, I'm really happy to take questions and I thank you all so much for your attention. All right, so we have a question in the chat. Why does the absorber work at one degree uh, C? Um, I'm not sure I understand the question. Um, which absorber? Uh, in the, uh, the transition and sensor absorber? Here, yes, yes. Um, yeah, so um, it actually works at, it's actually closer to one degree Kelvin, which is actually um, like minus 273 C or something like that. Um, so it actually works at incredibly, incredibly low temperatures. Um, and, you know, the absorber is actually what absorbs the photons. The thing that actually needs that cold temperature is the tiny resistor that's on the edge of that absorber that actually measures the change in temperature. Um, and just for some reason, superconducting works at very low temperatures. It's really hot, hard to build a high temperature superconductor. Um, and like, I don't know the physics behind that. I don't even know if we actually do know like why, um, but that is the temperature of the superconductors that we use. And there's another um, aspect to this, which is that if you have a warm detector, um, just ignoring that whole superconducting thing completely, if you have a warm detector, that detector itself has all these like thermal motions in that material from being hot itself. And that actually creates a signal as well um, that we read out as noise essentially in our sensor. Um, so that makes it difficult to read tiny, tiny signals if your noise in your sensor is much larger than them. All right, so we have another question, another two questions. The first one is, what is your advice to a telescope researcher and what suggestions do you have to further one's research? Yeah, um, so I think it kind of depends, um, like, you know, like where you are in your journey. Um, <laughs> so uh, like one of the things that really helped me was like when I was an undergraduate, I did research um, with faculty in our department and that like really helped me kind of guide me in terms of like what research there is to do. Um, at least for me, when I'm researching on my own, like it's hard for me to kind of figure out like what the questions are. And when I had that slide on like, how do we decide what to measure? Like that's an incredibly complicated question that like was much simplified by that, which is that like as a field and like as folks doing astronomy, like not just in academia, but everywhere, like folks thinking about astronomy, we come up with questions and like we come up with different questions, you know, from talking to different people. And like, so, I mean, I think my advice is like, talk to people about what you're interested in. Like if you have a question or something that you think is, you know, you know, it's just in your head, you're like, wh why does it work this way? You know, like talking to other people, basically like either your peers or, you know, your friends or, you know, faculty at the university, you know, like just talk to people about those because I think at least for me, that really helped me focus like, okay, what questions? Like I would hear about these questions. I was like, wait, studying light, like from the very beginning of the universe, like you can do that? <laughs> like, you know, that like that kind of drew me to that just by like learning more about the different things that you can discover. 
um, I don't know. I can. I don't know if that really answers your question, but I do think it's very collaborative. All right, we have another question. What causes electromagnetic emission during a neutron star merger? Oh, actually, that is a great question, and part of it is like some stuff in the shocks like in like there's like you know they merge but there's a lot of things around them that's happening um you know so there's like basically the matter that's around them being expelled um and uh creating shocks but like this actually isn't my area of expertise so i don't actually know that much about uh like the exact things that are happening around those neutron stars but it's a great question um and like a huge area of research right now all right, next question. You have a lot. Um, how did you stumble into this career and this research area? Um, yeah, that's actually a good question. Um, so I have like my, like I, ha I had a few moments I think in my life and like one of them is like there's, there was this Stephen Hawking show <laughs> on PBS that was about basically the grand unified theory of the universe and like that like I was pretty young and then I think I was like in like maybe 12 or something and like I guess I just thought that was really cool I didn't really know what physicists did but I was like that sounds really cool um so that was like first when I was like physics sounds cool um and then I think it was basically in college when I had an opportunity to see what a research lab was like and I guess like for me I don't know if this is like a weird way of putting it, but when I'm building instruments, like I feel like I think some people might feel when they're gardening, like I feel very at peace <laughs> and I feel like I'm creating something meaningful and it just like, just the action of doing it feels very like wonderful to me. And when I realized that like you actually can combine that with d like discovering fundamental physics about our universe, like I just found that very exciting because I didn't necessarily think of myself as someone that would come up with like a theory about physics, but like, you can really discover things about the universe by like doing things with your hands, which like I absolutely love. Um, so I think I was very lucky to have like a research experience um, early on. So that kind of got me thinking like this, I, I just want to study the early universe. Like I want to understand our universe on like these giant scales and, um, and I can do something that I like really, really love while doing that kind of, yeah. All right, are lasers used for the cooling of the superconductor? Mm. So they're not. Um, in this case, we actually use something. So yeah, so you know, laser cooling is a way to cool things down to super low temperatures. Um, we actually use um, basically refrigerators that use helium, um, and we actually use the um, like the the rare isotope of helium. So helium is like helium four, but there's a rare isotope of helium three. It actually has a boiling temperature that is much, much lower. So helium four's boiling temperature is four Kelvin, which is already incredibly cold. So you can use liquid helium four to get to like four Kelvin. And then you use a refrigerator that uses helium three. So this rare isotope of helium three as a coolant to get to like 250 millikelvin. All right, is there any way a hobbyist can become more involved in interesting projects like what you've worked on without going back to school? Yeah, that's actually a good question. Um, and I think that like, we should be very open to that. Um, I would definitely be open to talking to someone like, you know, via email about that. Um, yeah, because there's often like research technician jobs. Um, and I think it depends on the university. I'm actually really new to this university. So I don't exactly know like how like, you know, temporary work on projects works here. Um, but I think that there should be if there isn't like a way to participate and i think that like especially like on the theoretical side like there probably is like much you know it's like really possible to participate um on the experimental side i think that like we should think about that like together if anyone's interested um in ways that that's possible um because like i said there's just so many different jobs <laughs> within this one job um and i think that like there's just ways for people to kind of contribute in a lot of different ways Diana, who is five, would like to know why our eyes cannot see microwave light. Hmm, that's actually a really good question. I love when people ask me questions that I don't know the answer to, because um, I'm like, I have something to learn here. Um, so I will say that, I will say like the way I think about it, and I think this is part of the answer, but um, it sounds like there's like a deep, you know, there's like something more to investigate here. Um, but basically, if you want to pick up certain wavelengths of light, your sensor has to be approximately on the scale of 
uh, things that um, the wavelength of light. So microwave light, you know, its wavelength is something like a few millimeters um, up to like, you know, a few. Yeah, anyways, it's in the millimeter wavelength range. So like the sensors that we use to pick up that light are approximately that size. Um, so I think that we need structures that size. And we also, they're also super, super, super low energy. So a given photon in the microwave is super low energy. So I bet like there's just not, like we need a special sensor that can pick up that like super, super low energy um, light. But that's my partial answer because I think that's an excellent question that should, yes, <laughs> you should figure it out and let me know. <laughs> Uh, could you list some key global Canadian astronomy related events that most astronomers love to attend every year? I actually don't really know. I'm a, I'm new to Canada. I just moved here like about six months ago. So I'm not the right person to ask that question to, but I think that someone here probably knows way better than me. Uh, if anyone has any suggestions, they could. Yeah, Katerina, I mean, feel free to stick them in the chat. Uh, if anyone else has any other questions for Professor Kreitz, feel free to also stick those in the chat. And while you're potentially brainstorming questions, Professor Kreitz, if you could go to the next slide, that would be awesome. Uh, so ASX is uh, collaborating with uh, SEDS Canada and RU Hacks from Ryerson University to host the Toronto chapter of the NASA Space Apps Hackathon Challenge this weekend. Registration is completely free. It's open to anyone who wants to participate and it is still open. Uh, basically this challenge is just a coding and statistics challenge uh, where you go online, you collaborate with other people who are participating and you uh, just work to solve problems that NASA gives you uh, and compete against other people who are doing the same thing. So if you're interested in that, uh, feel free to just snap a picture of the links that we have on the slide and you're welcome to register. Again, it's completely free. And if you could go to the next slide. Uh, in addition, uh, we also have our ASX Space Trivia event. It is our first event uh, of this nature that we're going to be doing. So we're gonna try and turn it into a series. And basically what we're going to do is in two weeks, we're going to have space trivia, which is on a similar theme uh, related to the talk that Professor Craig just gave. If you're just interested in that, uh, the event's gonna be going up on Facebook very soon and make sure that you attend. Now we also have some more questions for Professor Craig. Up next is how do you measure the depth of a black hole? Uh, you're muted. <laughs> um, I'm always muted. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily think of it maybe as the depth, um, but I, you know, I might think about it as like the mass of the black hole. So one of the ways you can measure the mass is you can look at uh, like stars orbiting around it nearby um, and you can use, you know, gravitational equations to uh, measure the mass there. Um, in terms of depth, like I'm not actually sure that has much, um, like I, we just, because of the way black, the nature of black holes, like we don't necessarily think of it in that way. Um, like they don't really have a depth actually. Um, so yeah. Are there any areas of astronomy you've done research on in the past other than your current area of study? Mm -hmm. So I've actually stuck with this one for a while. Um, studying galaxies in um, the, what we call the epoch of reionization. So that was kind of the middle part in my timeline history. Um, studying ionized carbon from those galaxies is actually new research for me um, from the uh, cosmic microwave background. So most of my career was spent on the cosmic microwave background and then I transitioned to study these galaxies, but we use a lot of the same technology to do those studies. Um, so we're kind of uh, combining technology, but doing different science. Um, and then actually, so the UV stuff that I mentioned, so that's a totally new field for me. Like I'm just learning about it. Um, so I'm excited about it. We're like, let's build a new kind of instrument. Um, but it's totally new for me science wise. So I'm still learning. Um, and I'm actually pretty excited about like learning something new um, that I don't know much about. Um, but also building instruments. It's kind of like my comfort. <laughs> it's like my safety and like my like reach uh, science. So it's nice to be familiarly building instruments while learning new science that I don't know much about. All right, uh, does anyone else have any further questions? All 
Are there any advantages or disadvantages to using helium-3 for the cooling? Has laser cooling been applied to instruments before? Yeah, so a lot of the times laser cooling is used when you want to cool like a very tiny thing to like super, super cold temperatures, like much colder than what we're looking at. Um, at least the laser cooling I'm familiar with. Um, so helium-3 has the advantage that it's relative, I mean, I say easy, but it's not easy. Like it's expensive um, and it's not super easy, but with in a somewhat straightforward way, you can cool like a big hunk of metal down to low, like reasonably low temperatures. So that's kind of what we like, we need to, like our focal plane there is like, it's like 30 kilograms. Like <laughs> it's like really heavy. Um, so we're cooling this giant hunk of metal plus the tiny, tiny detectors on top to pretty low temperatures. So the helium, the advantage of the helium free refrigerator is that it has what we like, what we call in the field cooling power. So it's like, how much, you know, can we cool? Um, and like, how much heat load can we take and like cool? And like, we have all those structures that are adding heat load and we have wires going in that are adding this extra heat load, you know, like we have a lot um, going on there. So we need like low temperatures, like reasonably low temperatures, but we also need a lot of cooling power because we have all these parasitic like heats from the electronics we need to actually read out our instrument. If you pointed a powerful telescope at a black hole at just the right spot, could you see light coming from Earth that has wrapped around the black hole and is now heading back at us? Um, hmm. So, like, like basically hasn't actually gone into the black hole, essentially. Because once the light goes into the black hole, like, you won't actually see it anymore. Like, that's one of the, you know, physics of the black holes is that, like, the light's actually absorbed. Um, light that bends around to the point where it shoots back. So I think it would be, so, so you're totally right that light bends around huge gravitational objects. I think it would be hard to get like the right gravitational potential that actually reflects it back, you know, that bends it all the way around back to you. So things are distorted by black holes, but I think not to that degree. But again, this isn't my area of expertise, but um, yes. But the way, so, you know, there is bending of light, but not quite 180 degrees, I think is the answer to that. All right, so we'll wait maybe another minute to see if anyone has any other questions. All right, it doesn't look like that's the case. So Professor Kreitz, oh, no, it is. Look at that, okay. If a black hole is a singularity, how does it spin? Oh, um, I don't think I'm qualified to answer this question, actually. Um, I, I'm not really, I don't really know that much about black holes. Um, so I'm not gonna answer uh, and tell you something wrong. I hope that that's okay with you. <laughs> um, but hopefully you can find someone that's like better equipped to answer it than me. but clearly you all need someone to talk about black holes again. <laughs> all right, so I think if there are no further questions, we'll wrap it up here. Thank you very much once again, Professor Kreitz, for coming here to talk to us today. Uh, yeah. And thank you to everyone who came out to listen. We'll see you again at our next event, which is the trivia night. Oh, Josh wants to know if you're excited about the James Webb. So I actually am really excited. Um, so like I said, those, like the early galaxies that we're trying to measure, you can measure them with James Webb, like some of the really, really bright ones. Um, so it will be like a really good uh, kind of complementary experiment to what the experiment that we're building to study early galaxies right now. So I'm super excited. Um, 
I'll be patient though, because if we do our experiment first, that's actually good for me. So I'm like, take your time. No, no, I'm, I actually would be super psyched for it to go as soon as possible because there's so much awesome science. But um, yeah, I really appreciate everyone coming and asking the questions. Like I love it um, and I have really enjoyed my talk. All right, thank you everyone. Thank you, Professor Kreitz, and we'll see you at the next event. Bye.